the children's smiles belie the depth of their trauma. The school is one of many sheltering the displaced, the blaring music temporarily drowning out the sounds of the explosions on the front line just a 15-minute drive away. Even at their tender age, they know death can come in an instant. Tara is trying to have fun, gingerly keeping her weight off her injured foot. I was eating an apple with my sister, and then the rocket hit us, she remembers. I looked, and I could only see dust and blood. That strike happened a week ago at the school just next door, where Dalat's family, along with others, were living. A rocket slammed into the schoolyard, killing seven children and wounding many more. Dalat's father shows us her bandaged foot, grateful his daughter is still alive, agonizing over how he is supposed to even protect his children. I am used to the sounds of the planes hitting, Dalat says, but since we got hit, I'm scared of it. They've been training the kids on what to do if they hear explosions or the bombings come close. So one is shelter in place. Um, and then the other, though, is to follow the arrows painted on the walls to go towards the bunker. It's not a real bunker, just a room underground that used to store the now dust-covered school books. The skies outside the town are painted with the streaks of fighter jets. In the early hours the next morning, a chicken farm being used to house the displaced was decimated, crushing many of those who sheltered there in their sleep including children. Hospitals are overwhelmed, dealing not only with illnesses and disease, but the constant flow of the wounded. There is no sanctity here, least of all for civilian life. In the last month, Turkey has upped its military involvement, battering regime positions. This group of fighters we meet close to the front is mostly made up of young men who were in high school when Syria's revolution turned into a war. The Turkish presence is preventing the regime from advancing on the ground, 26-year-old Abu Saad says. Our fight is about defending the population, my wife, my children. But how to truly protect this population? It's not really in these fighters' control. It's in Turkey and Russia's hands. They, the main two powers, bartering for Idlib's fate. No matter what is negotiated, there have been too many promises, too many broken ceasefires, too many sham agreements. Pain haunts every street. His son died right here. That's still Adam his blood Ibn. on the wall. Adam Ibn. Muhammad was just 12. His older brother tells us they ran when they saw the plane, but Muhammad didn't make it. I tried to pick him up, but I couldn't, Hussein remembers. Muhammad died in his arms. Even celebrations are bittersweet. These women are shopping for dresses for their relative's wedding but it won't be a lavish affair. It's not the sort of happiness where you invite everyone, the groom's sister tells us. It will be small with immediate family. There's just too much misery and fear that a big crowd will get bombed. Since December, around a million have been displaced, cramming into any empty space they can find, even this prison. The families here sleep with their clothes on, not knowing when they might need to run out. Marine's father was killed fighting years ago. He used to play a lot with us when he was alive, she remembers. As we leave, we come across what's known as the graveyard camp, for even the dead are displaced, buried as close as possible to the border with Turkey, in the hopes that at least they can rest in peace. Arwa Damon Siena, Idlib, Syria.